Family vlogs have been a thing as far back as YouTube itself has existed. The idea of family vlogging sounds good in theory, right? It's good-natured, friendly content that can be watched by kids and parents alike. The sort of content that you keep up with over a long period of time, connecting to the family as if they were your neighbors or your friends. But oftentimes, well-intended theories have a funny habit of losing their way when put into practice. I'm not going to hide the fact that I have a bias in this case, and it will probably show as the video progresses. In fact, it probably shows in the title. I don't like family channels. Granted, I'm not exactly their target demographic, but there's something about this type of content that has always rubbed me the wrong way. I will say this though, I am aware that there's certain aspects of parenthood that I can't relate to at this stage of my life because I don't have kids. Although having Wilfer is sometimes not that far off. Damn it, Wilfer, get down from there! But what I can relate to is having a YouTube channel and everything that that comes with. And when I see family channels and the sneaky little tricks that they pull, all the way up to the full-blown scandals they more and more often find themselves in, I feel like I should voice my perspective on it. So today we're taking a look at family vlogging channels, the problematic nature of the concept, and all the relevant instances when exploiting children has been in full swing. Just want to take a quick moment before we jump into things to thank our sponsor for today, XP Pen. But we're going to talk about it a little more towards the end of the video. I read an interesting article recently on the psychology of social media, which I will link below if you're interested in checking it out. It was talking about how researchers found insecurity to be the main driving force behind posting on social media. Shocking, right? <laughs> Noting that sharing the good bits of their life often gives individuals an increase in self-esteem but a decrease in self-control. And obvious as that may be to anybody with a little bit of self-awareness, it's a trap that everybody can fall into. Now that's all fine and dandy when all you're posting is what you're eating and how hard you've been working out, but when your content is based around your children, things can very quickly take an unpleasant turn. And to make a point here, we're gonna go into story time mode really quick. So gather around, kids. We're talking about moms being predatory with their kids without even realizing it. So a few years ago, I was browsing Facebook, back when that was still a thing that people under 40 years old did, and I saw an old classmate of mine from middle school who had recently given birth to a baby boy. And she was posting a picture of her kid completely naked with a caption saying something like, I don't understand why everyone has a problem with my child. I don't care how many times you're reporting this picture, I will continue to repost it because I'm proud of my child and you cannot take that away from me. And I remember thinking, lady, people are reporting the picture to protect your child from online creeps, because in your delusion and chase for validation, you are endangering someone you are supposed to be protecting. You see, in this world of oversharing, I think for some mothers in particular, getting the endorphins from those likes and social engagement is directly incompatible with the responsibility to shield their child from harm. This is something that's not being talked about enough, in my opinion. Not only do parents slash older people generally not have a good grasp on how the internet itself works, but they are oftentimes oblivious to the dangers of sharing private and embarrassing information about their kids when they are too young to be able to even consent to it. And so far, we're talking about just posting to a bunch of Facebook friends. Imagine how much more perverse the dynamic becomes when sharing your children's information online becomes profitable. <laughs> Now, there's a family channel that has popped on my radar called The Norris Nuts. Brooke and Justin are the parents, and they currently have six children, ranging from 15 years old down to six months old. And this channel has a concerning amount of videos revolving around the mother trying to have more children, with titles like, Are we having another baby? Exciting announcement, trying to have a baby update. The baby needs to come out due to pregnancy complications. Are the kids ready to deliver the baby? We've had some bad news about mama's pregnancy. Pregnancy complication for our baby and it goes on and on and on. And if you look at some of these videos with a critical mind, you can't escape the question how much of this comes from a genuine place and how much of it is straight up crossing a line. Because she's turning the entire process into a weird messed up kids show. If you catch this ball, it means I'm pregnant. If you miss it, it means I'm not pregnant from fertilization to talking about it with the children, trips to the doctor, to straight up documenting her carriage. I was gonna tell you that um, I'm bleeding and I'm not pregnant. It's not my fault. It's not your fault. It is. It's not your fault. 
Now I've blurred out the kids' faces because I want no part in further exposing them to the public, but I think there needs to be some attention drawn to this channel and channels like this that have made a profitable business from using their kids in a way that would make any rational person feel uncomfortable. And to make one thing very clear, I do think that sometimes it's important to share certain details about the challenges of a pregnancy, or perhaps how to deal with the psychological effects of a miscarriage. These are medical realities that other women in similar circumstances might find solace in. But where I think Brooke Norris crosses a line is the way she involves her kids in the process. I mean, for Christ's sake, she's filming her 10-year-old son as he bursts into tears thinking it was his fault that she lost the pregnancy. The video has since been taken down, but it had millions of views and it was monetized. And I know at this point there may be hardcore fans of their channel arguing that the kids want to be part of this. You may say they are just concerned because they love their mother. And in most cases, they're excited to film videos for the channel. So if the kids are having fun making these YouTube videos, what's the harm in that? Well, to answer the question, we have to get one thing clear right away. What a child likes, or what they think they like, is based on an immature understanding with a brain that has not yet fully developed. That's why legally, the parent is responsible for every major decision in a child's life until they've reached the age of 18. They alone are responsible to choose what's right for the kids. But when the parent finds purpose and profit in the image of the children, what's right for the kids gets muddled by what's right for the business. And that is a dangerous territory. Return on investment, or ROI. It's a term used in business to determine whether an investment generates enough revenue to turn a profit. For example, if you have a golden goose and you make a living off selling its golden eggs, as long as what you're feeding the goose, putting the roof over its head, and keeping it happy so that it lays more eggs, as long as all of those expenses add up to less than what you're earning per golden egg, the whole operation is ROI positive. But if the goose bites you, if it only lays eggs when it feels like it, or in other words, if the goose is named Wilfer, who I don't even know, do you even lay eggs? Cause you're like a boy goose. <laughs> Well, if that's the case, then the whole thing is ROI negative for you, and you should probably start looking into getting a regular job. With that in mind, let's talk about Micah Stouffer. Some of you may have already heard about her because she was recently involved in a very public scandal. Micah, along with her husband James, are the parents of three children, and you guessed it, they have a family vlogging channel. The Stouffers adopted an autistic boy from China in 2017, and because of the novelty factor of having an adopted Chinese boy with special needs, their channel skyrocketed. I have so many viewers that found me through my adoption journey and they are here to kind of live through those adoption updates and kind of see how he's doing and watch him progress. If you are one of those people that are here for that, give this video a thumbs up. Well, apparently two years after the adoption, with the boy being prominently featured on their YouTube and Instagram, bringing in a lot of revenue for them, the Stouffers all of a sudden decided in 2019 to return the boy. This of course blew up in their face. They're currently losing a lot of subscribers and getting a lot of backlash. In my opinion, rightfully so. Because the problem here isn't that a family has returned an adopted child that they weren't qualified to raise. That apparently happens one to 5% of all adoption cases, but it usually happens with in a relatively short time frame. The Stouffer's channel benefited immensely from keeping the adopted boy for two years before sending him back, making it more difficult for him to fit in with a new family because he is now older. The overall public impression right now is that Micah Stouffer would not have adopted the boy if she didn't expect in some way to enrich her brand. And I kind of get the same feeling watching her videos. By all accounts, it looks like the adoption was a calculated move that had to be reverted when it stopped being ROI positive. Eight Passengers is another case of a couple of vlogging parents mistreating their children multiple times. Like in many other similar cases, the mother, Ruby, runs the channel, and it looks like the overarching theme of her videos is the strict discipline measures she imposes on her six children. A lot of the videos on the channel are now deleted, but in many cases you could hear the kids tell their mother they don't want to be on camera. They also often joke about how many lashes they deserve for various actions. So what? Do you think is a reasonable outcome? 50 for you? lashings. Uh, <laughs> she stands on the ottoman and we all throw rotten tomatoes at her. <laughs> and then we put her in that shing where her neck and her hands are like locked and she sits like that all day. 
<laughs> so distracting. In order to fix the behavior of her oldest son, Ruby and her husband decided to send him away to live for months at a place called Anasazi Camp. Now, I've looked into this place, and they claim to be a troubled teens wilderness treatment center, where teenagers discover a profound sense of self-worth and responsibility for the choices that govern the course of their lives. And they do that, among other things, by allegedly having the kids wipe their butts with rocks. We were told setting bear traps is the language we're going to use for, um, you know, instead of, toilet paper. instead of toilet paper. And so I told Kevin, this is a terrible wiping rock. That would be terrible. That would be terrible. Would be but terrible. This, but one this one wouldn't be bad. is smooth. I think that would work. Mm -hmm. And here's the mind-boggling thing. Multiple kids have died at these types of wilderness camps due to barbaric punishment by the camp instructors. There's articles about this online, and I'm gonna link some below if you're interested to find out more. Ruby came under fire when the oldest son openly talked in a vlog about how he hadn't been sleeping on a bed for seven months. My bedroom was taken away for seven months and then you give it back like a couple of weeks ago. I don't think our viewers know that. Sleeping on a bed. Sleeping on a bean bag <laughs> <laughs> My broom back like two weeks ago. This sparked outrage in the comments and has put a spotlight on Ruby and her excessive discipline methods. And I think what we see here is how as years go by and the kids in the vlogs grow up to be teenagers, they start to realize the messed up dynamic of being used for entertainment. I think there's an expiration date on any family channel. When we see this pattern of kids starting to rebel and not want to be a character in their parents' reality show anymore, that should, in my opinion, be an indicator of the almost abusive nature of family vlogging. I think whatever example we choose to look at, when children become a business, the parent's predominant role is no longer that of a guardian. The child is now an asset for the parent. And it goes back to that study I mentioned early on in the video. That increase in self-esteem and decrease in self-control, which gets pushed even more off balance when large amounts of money get thrown in the equation. Now, are there family channels that manage to keep a relatively balanced dynamic? Yeah, I'm sure there are. In fact, most family channels probably start off with good intentions. But it's the high probability of the parents' morals getting skewed as time progresses and the channel gets bigger that puts the entire genre in a dangerous zone. And for that reason, I strongly believe there should be regulation and guidelines in place when it comes to online content involving children. Whether the mother is trading in the child's privacy for a dozen likes on Facebook, or she creates a disturbing storyline of doctor visits and bad news monetizing her children's reactions. Whether we're talking about a mother adopting a child for financial gain and discarding him when he becomes an inconvenience, or a mother using inhumane treatments and shoving a camera in the kids' faces despite visible discomfort. In all of these examples, one connecting thread is the replacement of parenting with self-serving irresponsibility. And that is why, in my opinion, family channels should not exist. Now, this is obviously a topic that's much larger than what I could sum up in one video, so please let me know your opinions in great detail, because this is a topic that I think can spark a lot of debate, and I'm I'm interested in reading all of the well-argumented comments down below. Now, on a lighter note, I want to take a moment to talk about our sponsor, the XP Pen Artist Display 24 Pro Tablet. I've used XP Pen tablets in the past, and I have to say, they're up there in my good books, so when they reached out offering to sponsor this video, I was genuinely excited. They've got a new display tablet coming out, the Artist 24 Pro, and this product looks really promising. It connects through a USB-C cable to any computer, whether that's a MacBook Pro, iMac, or Windows computer, supporting all of the up-to-date operating systems. It's also compatible with all the popular digital art software, Photoshop, Illustrator, 3ds Max, Krita, Blender, you name it. The display comes in 2K QHD resolution, thus offering a lot of creative control over the line work and level of detail, which is fantastic for a display tablet in this price range. The stylus works battery-free, you don't have to charge it, which is a major plus for me, because it's always annoying when you have to charge a pen, but not this one. And it also supports 60 degrees of tilt function. And here's something really simple, but something that I like a lot. It's the nifty little pen slot up here that can hold your stylus whenever you're not using it. It's stuff like this or the touch sensitive keys, which are designed to avoid sticking. It's all of this stuff that when you look at it, you realize that they put a lot of thought into the user experience during the design process. Now, again, this is not a portable tablet, but if you're a professional, it's a great addition to your desk, especially if you're looking for an alternative to the Cintiq at like half the price. So if you're considering purchasing one for your 
yourself, remember to use my custom link in the description. You'll get a pretty nice discount and you're helping out the channel. So once again, thank you to XP Pen for sponsoring us. Thank you for watching and we'll see you again very soon.